Welcome to African Roots, brought to you by DW. In this podcast series, we discover how individuals from across Africa shape the continent. I'm Leila Johnson Salami. And I'm Kai Nebe. How's it going, Leila? All good, Kai. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Leila, I want to talk about school, or at least education, because for so long throughout human history, it was either non-existent or simply the preserve of the elite. And speaking of which, I recently worked out that I have literally spent half my conscious life in school. And that's a long time. And that just maybe shows just... Ha <laughs> that's the age trap. <laughs> that's the age trap. But you do raise a point and... Um... To be honest, I would even argue that education is still the preserve of the elite. Um, maybe not as much as before, but yeah, <laughs> still kind of is. Yeah, well, we, as we know, there's probably some people still doing PhDs and whatever that probably last forever. But uh, be that as it may, I want to introduce you to someone who long, long, long ago tried to accelerate learning in North Africa. And when I say long ago, I, 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 I really mean it long ago. Mm, it sounds like you're going quite far back today. Uh, are you going back to like before humans were even humans? <laughs> or how far back are we talking? <laughs> no, let's try the 9th century and the city of Fez in modern day Morocco. Uh, so the person I I'm going to be talking about is Fatima Alfiri. She is perhaps most famous for investing all her wealth into building the beautiful Al Karawin Mosque, a place of prayer and learning, especially for the community of exiled Tunisians in the city of Fez. <laughs> Today, Al Karawin is recognized as one of, if not the most ancient university in the world. And we'll get a bit more into that later on. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in knowing about the women behind it. Yeah, so Fatima was born in Tunisia in 800 AD or around that time into an extremely wealthy merchant family. But she was forced to flee persecution in Tunisia. And I mean, Tunisia didn't exist as a country then, but we're using the geographical terms as a frame of reference, with numerous Arab families before settling in Fez. And although Fez wasn't so much a city back then, it is now. And according to historian Mohammed Yasser Hilali, this situation made all the difference. <laughs> Fatima probably would not have thought of building a mosque if she hadn't inherited such a fortune from her father and her husband. The latter was involved in trading activities. Having so much money at her disposal inspired her to pursue a project, that of building a mosque. And that mosque became the Al Karawin Mosque, and it still stands today. But what's really interesting about it is that although there was a strong religious element to it, the mosque was also conceived as a place of education. Interesting. I'll be honest, if I had nine digits in the bank, <laughs> I'm sitting here wondering what I would spend it on. Well, Leila, let's get to let's get to billionaire status before we solve the problem of <laughs> of that, I guess. Thanks for that reality check. <laughs> Um, no, but really, I guess Fatima was um, a strong believer to embark on this project in the first place. Yes, and anecdotes suggest that for Fatima Alfiri, this gigantic project was a way to get closer to Allah. But also it had to accommodate the growing population of the city of Fez. Uh, the the idea of building a mosque is linked to the times of governors Idris II and Yahya the First. Fatima had heard that the mosque built by Idris II could not take any more believers. Yet at that time, Fez had a lot of migrants coming from the rest of Africa, but also from Andalusia in Spain. The population was doubling not only because of the demographic growth, but also because of these migratory flows. The fact that Fatima Alfiri decided to build this mosque shows how much she cared about the problems of the city she lived in. 
There's another element to the construction of the mosque which I find amazing. It shows Fatima really putting her money where her mouth is, and like in a very literal sense. Contrary to what some stories assert, the construction could not have lasted that long because Fatima had promised to fast until the achievement of the project. We know that the building process had started during Ramadan, which is the month during which Muslims must fast. Then she continued to fast after Ramadan until the end of the construction. Whoa. Until the construction was over. Wait, wait, wait. That, that takes a very strong mind. Yeah, <laughs> and a whole lot of will. Like, if I fasted mm -hmm. until the plumber showed up at my flat, well, uh, <laughs> let's not go. <laughs> anyway, th so this mosque gradually becomes a university and a famous one at that. Islamic scholars from across the Sahel region and southern Europe come to give lectures. The transition became official with the Marinid dynasty and with many additional annexes being added to the mosque throughout the city. Uh, and on a side note, the Marinid dynasty was an empire that stretched all across the North African Mediterranean coast and was kind of a golden age for Fez. We talk about the intellectual influence around the al Karawiyin Mosque, but it actually went beyond Morocco's borders to sub-Saharan Africa, what used to be Sudan. Several scholars from the region came to Fez to study. Then they brought back the Moroccan culture and the education they got at the al Karawiyin University to their own countries. In other words, the influence of al Karawiyin Mosque was huge in sub-Saharan Africa. And al Karawiyin University still receives new students every year. Indirectly, Fatima al firis legacy is alive today and there are even scholarships and prizes in her name that encourage access to training and professional responsibilities for women. Brilliant. So... Fatima chose to spend her riches educating others and safeguarding knowledge for future generations, um, or at least her representatives did. Yeah, and can you really think of a better investment than education, you know, when we have the mm. problem of being billionaires in the future? Mm, my lifestyle? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm just joking, guys. <laughs> um, education is the bedrock of society. When we come back, we are heading to Timbuktu, where we'll discover a treasure trove of ancient knowledge. DW African Roots. Find new African Roots episodes on dw.com slash African Roots, Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. Goodness, we're back in the desert again, Leila. Ha! News flash, Kai. The Sahara Desert is pretty big, and chances are its winds and sand grains are going to find their way into our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but picture this scene: um, you are a learned man when you receive a request that goes like this. Dear Ahmed Baba, we, the inhabitants of Tuat, consult you, prominent jurist of Timbuktu so that you may enlighten us about the question of slavery. We would like to know if black Africans are slaves in essence, or if once they are converted and Muslims, they should be free. What is your opinion on that question? We would be very grateful to you. Oh dear, that is a very loaded request. Uh, I hope that didn't come in the form of a tweet. Mm, yeah, because we're bang in the middle of the social media era. <laughs> No, I've taken you back to the early 1600s. Right. But who is Ahmed Baba? Appa uh, apparently, I am the one receiving it, me being Ahmed Baba. So 
who is this guy? Who who am I? Who, who is the who is the guy this is addressed to? <laughs> um, well, spot on. Um, Ahmed Baba is a scholar who lives in Timbuktu, and by now quite a well-respected sage. Um, he was born around 1556 in the northern part of modern-day Mali. Right, and and Timbuktu was quite famous for its scholars or universities at that time, right? It sure was. Um, in the Muslim world of the Sahel, Timbuktu had a wealth of academic knowledge and exchange. Um, but the city's economy relied on another form of exchange that is definitely less savory. Uh, Timbuktu became rich as a hub of the slave trade. Well, less savory is an understatement. So, mm -hmm. Leila, what is Ahmed Baba actually answering here then? Well, his answer to the inhabitants of Tuat comes in the form of a fatwa, um, legal advice. Bernard Salveng, professor emeritus of history and specialist in Malian manuscript uh, culture, explains what this text contains. This is what Ahmed Baba answers. He points out that slavery is only legitimate for non-Muslims, regardless of their origin, whether black or white, so this is not a question of race. It must be noted that many people had prejudices according to which black people were slaves and pagans by nature. In this respect, Ahmed Baba's answer can therefore be considered as innovative, and at the same time, of course, it legitimizes, in terms of Islamic law, the capture of unbelievers during the jihad. Well, that still doesn't sound particularly good. He's not exactly condemning slavery, is he? No, but what he does do is interpret the law quite radically, I must say. Um, he says that anyone can be a Muslim, including black people, and that they should be excluded from slavery for that reason. At the time, um, many believed that black people's fate was slavery, um, and that was quite significant. Okay. You do sound unsure about this yeah. one, Kai. <laughs> yeah. um, this, this also wasn't the first time that Ahmed Baba voiced an unpopular opinion in his legal career. Earlier, in May 1591, Timbuktu was about to fall to the Moroccan Sultan Al-Mansur, and Ahmed Baba didn't like that, and he opposed his city's annexation. I, I guess I'm not unsure per se. It's just I'm really doing the mental gymnastics trying to work out... No, what kind of person Ahmed Baba was? I mean, so what happened? Mm, well, Ahmed Baba and several other intellectuals um, are arrested and taken to Morocco, bound in chains. After several months that were spent in prison, he's placed under house arrest in Marrakesh. But Ahmed Baba, who already had a sizable reputation as an Islamic scholar, gets treated a little differently. Okay, in, in what way? Well, the Moroccan sultan allows him to teach, and this platform under the Moroccan empire, but in Moroccan captivity, allows Ahmed Baba to flourish, and his fame extends across the Maghreb. Um, during this exile, he even gets to finish one of his most famous manuscripts, the Kifayat al-Muqtaj, and this is especially important because it contains several hundred biographical texts about the different lives of great people of letters and scholars who lived between the 13th century and Ahmed Baba's time. For the historians, of course, it's a very important source to know the intellectual history of his time. Second observation, there are mostly scholars from the Maghreb and Spain. It shows the continuity between this Mediterranean Muslim culture and Timbuktu's scholarly Muslim culture, which is fully integrated in this Mediterranean Muslim world. Wow, that is a lot of work. So, did Ahmed Baba have to stay in exile? Good question. Um, no, but he did have to wait for Sultan Ahmed al-Mansur to die before he was allowed to return home to Timbuktu. He lived out his twilight years there, dying in 1627, and he was about 71 at the time. But, Leila, I'm still trying to get my head around it. Why, why exactly is Ahmed Baba so well regarded then? This guy left behind more than 60 manuscripts about legal issues, um, religious practices, as well as social relationships, but... Also about Arabic grammar or education. Um, remember, we're talking about a time where very few people practiced law or theorized on it, unlike today. 
Yeah, you can you can say that again. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, students today and researchers can come and admire and decipher copies of these manuscripts um, at the Institute of Higher Learning and Islamic Research, the Ahmed Baba Center. He became a national icon in today's Mali. Ahmed Baba and his time represent the end of Timbuktu's greatness. Furthermore, we can relate to him when he stresses the equality of all believers before God, regardless of their origin or their skin color. Then, of course, there is also his resistance to the occupant, which caused him to be deported. What's key, though, about Ahmed Baba is that he represents a high point in Timbuktu's relevance as a place of learning and law in the Islamic world. Um, of course, today, when we think of Timbuktu, it's at the center of the contested Sahel region um, between various governments and Islamic fundamentalist groups. But it wasn't always like that. Yeah, Timbuktu, I still would like to visit, I think. That's where we will have to leave things for today. African Roots is a cooperation between DW and the Gerda Henkel Foundation. Special thanks to our producers Michael Springer, Philip Zantner and our voiceover artists. Contributions by Constanze Fischer and Sela Oneko. I'm Kai Nebe. And I'm Leila Johnson-Salami. Join us again next time. Bye.